Hey, welcome everyone to the Solo Decathlon webinar, What is Good Design? And we're going to attempt today to give you a framework for just that, how to consistently, consistently provide really great designs uh, whenever you have a project. So it's a bold uh, challenge. And to do this, I'm going to have to first start with Here we go. I'm going to first start with some context. And the context for this framework is based on a book I wrote, Retooling the U.S. Housing Industry. And essentially what we've done uh, is provide builders a setting that is a historic moment in the housing industry. There are five crises facing the industry that are uniquely positioned, uh, uh, informed buyers, affordability, productivity, trades, innovation, are all imposing on the industry. And usually it's the lack thereof with each of these crises and whether the industry is ready to deal with them. And as a result of this historic confluence of five crises, there are four disruptions that we speak to at workshops with builders. The consumer experience imperative, mass customization, offsite construction, and software as a service. And we're here today to talk about this first disruption, the consumer experience imperative as the driver for good design. And we go through a whole array of, um, of, of different developments that are increasing the information consumers have. But the bottom line at the end of the day is that star ratings is coming to the housing industry. And if you think about it, Many of us, when we're in a new city or even in our own existing hometowns, when we go out and want to try a new restaurant, it's dubious whether we'll spend $60 on a meal if the restaurant isn't at least four or five stars. Same with a hotel. Will we go to a hotel if it's not four or five stars and just, just for $200 a night? So the question when we're spending four or $500,000 on a new home, what are the chances that we'll go to a builder that's not a four or five star builder? It's like a game changer now. And the websites that do feature these star ratings for builders, you start to see hundreds and often more than 1,000 or 1,500 ratings for different builders. So we're getting the volume, volume and number that you have to deliver a really compelling consumer experience to get to the consumer. And so what we teach in these building classes, again about context, is there's five experiences that you have to deliver. One is the community experience, one's the design experience, one's the performance experience, quality, and sales. And a zero means you're not addressing that experience, and a five means you're nailing it. I'm a hard grader, so I start out looking at the industry, and I give the industry fairly low numbers because I see so much opportunity. So this is a typical builder for me, and if I'm really lucky and get them to do zero energy ready home, we only get them on one of the experiences, a nice boost, and the other four don't get where they need to be. So what, a lot of what I do, apart from DOE, working with hundreds and hundreds of builder executives is what can we do to get you to move in, on a journey to look like this as a builder and have a product that delivers this kind of experience. In the end, what we try to do is convince them it's a five-legged stool. Every one of these experiences is critical. And if you fail in just one, you risk losing your customer loyalty for your entire business. So the focus for today is with this stool, the design leg stool. We're gonna try and see if we can give you a framework so you can consistent, consistently deliver great designs. As part of the competition, you're focused on the stool leg at the very right performance, zero ready, but you gotta do both. And that's why within the solar decathlon criteria and contest design is very, very compelling and very, very critical for at least two of the 10 contests. And it was intentionally so. Design is so criti critical to today's world in, in every product and housing is as important as any other. So let's, with that in mind, start looking at how do we get a framework for good housing design? And I always like to start with, how does that sit in the context of the overall goals uh, for the builder's business in this case for design. And there's three major goals. You're, you care about aesthetics, you care about functionality, and you care about all of that meeting a budget. And the way you're gonna get there, the how, is by your solutions that you have outside for the site, the exterior of the building, the interior of the building, and all the systems that have to be integrated for a complete structure. 
So that's the basic business. And the way we go about doing it usually is what you learn every day in school, every year in schools. You have three steps in design. You gotta program the building. How do people live or work or use that building? And then come up with iterative design solutions, schematics that get you and approximate towards a better and better ultimate final design solution. That's what we do. So now for the framework. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize, I've been doing this for five plus years with hundreds and hundreds of executives. And this framework I'm gonna run you through right now, I would submit has near consensus acceptance by the builders. When we challenge and ask them, what would you change? What would you do differently? How would you nuance this for your own business? Virtually we're getting a near consensus that this framework is a truly effective way to consistently deliver great designs. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna optimize location, that's your what. And the how is you gotta fit it to site. And there's a whole array of how you do that. Then you wanna optimize nature. And how you do that is by exploiting natural comfort. And I'll talk about the solutions there. Then you wanna optimize space and you do that by right sizing the right way. Then optimize form and that's achieved with architectural integrity. And finally, optimize function, you'll get there with really uh, fully integrated systems. And the reason the why behind all this is that how you live matters. You know, that's behind the whole programming of the design, the very front end. How do you live? You know, how do you use that space? How you live outside, how you live inside, and details make all the difference. And so how we're gonna get there, on fit the site, there are five concepts that we'll review with you. On natural comfort, there are five key concepts that we'll go over. In right size in the right way, there are two strategies with 10 concepts in total, five each. For architectural integrity, uh, integrity, we'll talk about three concepts. And integrated systems, there are 12 systems and three groups that we'll go over. And if you do all this, I will submit to you, you will consistently deliver great designs. So let's start in with fit to site. And I mentioned there are five concepts. You want to optimize the view. You've got to ensure effective drainage. Drainage. You want regionally appropriate materials, regionally appropriate resilience, and you want a community connection for those that are designing bigger subdivisions or developments. So let's look at how all of this works. And I'll take an iconic piece of architecture here and ask the question: Is this fit the site? And without question, it's it, it's incredibly beautiful. It's like a natural piece of sculpture just sitting in the landscape, it's breathtaking. But is it fit to site? And I will suggest to you that uh, the Eastern Highlands of Pennsylvania is one of the biggest snowfall areas in the entire US. Is it appropriate to build a snow capture solution as a residential structure? Essentially these amazing expanse of cantilevered slabs collect so much snow and there's so much freeze fall on this building is incredibly high. For those of you that had the privilege to visit it, you'll also probably notice if you go see it, it's incredibly com compartmentalized, very low ceilings, surprisingly dark inside the space, not enough daylight with all the dramatically long overhangs. So we can ask lots of questions. Is this iconic building fit to site? And the reality of course, is that um, it takes so much to maintain this building to really keep it surviving, it has become in effect a museum where millions pilgrimage to this building to see this amazing work of using concrete structure and natural setting, but it takes millions and millions of dollars to maintain and it's because it probably isn't fit to site and appropriate probably for its original function or residence. Here's another iconic building, Phil Johnson's glass house, and we can again ask the question, is this fit to site? You know, the Cold surfaces surrounding you, surrounding you every day uh, are going to create an incredibly, incredibly challenged interior comfort situation. Uh, uh, we understand the desire to capture views, but is this a house based on how you live? And we can challenge that concept. And even though it's an incredibly iconic home, say we might be concerned this is fit to site. All glass, an incredibly cold area, very cold surfaces, no privacy, no place to hang things. Lots of questions about whether this is really appropriate. Okay, moving on to views. 
uh, uh, the first concept. Uh, probably the view is a top priority when, for anyone who's a designer. You take a site and you look at it and you say, are there any natural views? And if there are any natural views, your job is to optimize them. And so here's a house in my neighborhood. And there's the main orientation. This is a standard builder design that was just inserted onto this piece of property. And what's a little disturbing is there's a view on the side with hardly any windows. 80% uh, of windows in the summer are in the front and the back and pretty much ignoring this beautiful pond off on the side of the building. So a big question is, is this optimized? And I would challenge and say, no, it's not. And what do you do if there is no view? And I think our job as architects and designers is if we look at our site and our assets that we have in terms of the site and there is no view, our job as a good designer is to create a view and courtyards are a great way to do that. Now, I'll give you some examples of how all this applies. Here's a uh, narrow apartment building on the ocean in Virginia Beach. And what happens is you have this amazing world-class view, this incredible, beautiful ocean on one side of the building and a horrible view of a street and an apartment building facing you on the other side. So the traditional side uh, design of a double loaded corridor with a whole set of rooms facing one side of the ocean and then a whole set of rooms facing the horrible side, the street and the building next door is the typical approach. And it winds up with half the rooms being highly undesirable in this building and substantial reduction in cost and half the tenants are very unhappy. They're on the ocean, they don't have a view. So is there a solution to this? So this is a normal design, uh, apartment by apartment. You have living space on one side and usually the bedrooms and core in the mid, on the corridor side. You have the core and you have the bedrooms on the other side. And so each apartment lays out and then you have half facing the street and half facing the ocean. And so it looks like this in section. There are half the apartments with a great view and the half in the back of the building are effectively substandard. So an alternative strategy based on famous French architect Le Corbusier would use this approach. What you do is you make the apartment half as wide and you make them two stories. So in one apartment, the second story is on the street side and the other apartment, the second story is on the ocean side, but every apartment has an ocean view and you wind up with one third the hallways which means all that extra hallway space goes back into additional apartment living with extra value. And it kind of looks like this. You have the corridor, every third floor with apartments on either side and the floors above and below are full, are full apartments, half as narrow. The cores now are in the middle, bedrooms on one side, living space on the other side. And you kind of get the idea how this works. So by starting with the premise at the very beginning that we have as an obligation as an architect or designer to optimize the view, you wind up with a completely different solution than you go with a traditional split corridor. Just shows you you can take a site and optimize it if that's your goal at the very beginning. Let's take an example with townhouses. In this case, you see a standard townhouse layout where you have townhouse after townhouse, and then the backs of the townhouse, you have a, a small postage stamp yard. And I would say this is, to me, normally a design failure. There's some cases where you may not have a choice, but many times you do, and I'll show you why. The backyard basically is often very useless and not a very effective space. One is you don't have privacy from your neighbor looking down into your yard. And two, the access to it's very limited. You'll have a room in the back, and then you have a walkway to get through to the backyard. You're not getting a lot of useful space out of the back of the house because you need to have access to the yard plus you're left with the uh whatever space is available for the room here's another uh, townhouse again the neighbor looking right down into your space you have a room to one side and then walking out to get to the backyard it really adds hallways and they're not valuable it's not an efficient layout and yet we do this over and over and over again remember what i said was that if there is no view your obligation as a designer is to create a view. So let's take and look at this situation. There's no view. There's no view in the back, there's park in the front. Our, our job is to create views and make living really exciting in our spaces. And not just in high-end housing, I mean, even affordable housing. 
So the solution would be take that lawn area that's those postage stamp bag yards and just get rid of it. Repurpose it so that you will get the same number of units on a given piece of property when you go to this design of L-shaped townhouses. So when you repurpose the land and figure it all, the site out, you should be able to get the same number of units. But what happens by creating an L-shaped townhouse and a courtyard on the side is you have now got a view. So you have a quiet side that can't look down into the courtyard of the neighbor next door. You have the active side with extensive amount of glass looking into the courtyard, i.e. the view. And you have basically uh, a walk through this beautiful courtyard space to get in the center so that you have a full room in front rather than having a room with a corridor going through it and a full front porch, again, without having to walk through the front porch to get into the house. So that's kind of the secret sauce, if you will, for making a townhouse live completely different with the same number of units on a given piece of property and a whole different experience. And here's an example how that was done in real life. And actually, I used to do this presentation without the example until uh, some research pop, popped it up. But here it is. And of all places in Pike Road, Alabama, this is a project called The Waters, and it's almost the exact concept layout that I showed you earlier, where you have an L-shaped townhouse, you have a beautiful courtyard that you go through, you have a middle entry, you have a full front porch, you have a full living space in front. You basically get to see how this works out to be a beautiful space. So here's, let me go back. Here's actually the waters in real life. That's the project, and you again see how you walk into the courtyard, the forefront porch, you see how the whole um, project lays out. Again, you get the same number of units, but you get a completely different living experience because as the designer, you start by saying, my job is to optimize the view. If I have a view, I leverage it. If I don't, I create it. And again, courtyards are amazing. They're transformative. They completely flip how a space lives. And there's lots of different techniques and styles, materials and choices you can use, but they are transformative. They are views. And so even in a busy street, I have my own oasis, a place that's beautiful. Okay, I hammered that one. Let's move on to next, effective drainage. Uh, here's a great example. And again, in my neighborhood where drainage ignored, slights, the site slopes right down to the building the solution simple, you create swales and let buildings drain more effectively. It's so critical you do this because this experience is one no builder or architect wants their client to have. Once you've had wet basements, you are almost permanently against that builder or architect. A wet basement's one of the worst experiences you can have as a homeowner. It's a constant fear. It's a constant sense of insecurity. It just ruins the living experience. You have to make sure that drainage is fully addressed and the site just has no possibility of getting wet basements. Uh, here is real roof drainage is ignored. If you have a lot of trees planned or existing around a home, you know that a valley configuration as opposed to a shed roof is basically a debris catching device. And so this is what the roof will look like a good portion of the year, five or six months, homeowners just don't crawl on their roofs every day and clean them off and they just accumulate debris. It takes nothing. Even during summer, you'd be surprised how much debris falls off trees. So we, I want you to remember if you do a valley in a location with meaningful trees, you're creating a debris catcher. You're ignoring the drainage function of roofs. Moving on to appropriate materials. Um, I'm a little bit crazy. I'm on a subway going home after an awards dinner downtown DC, and I just grab my camera, take this picture, and ask myself, what were they thinking? Which is a common question I like to ask. When they decided in the 1970s to put a metro system in and to choose carpet as the material for a transit uh, uh, metro system, that was insanity. There was no chance that carpet would ever be the appropriate material for its function. And it didn't take very long for it to get fully um, uh, worn out, full of dirt, uh, moldy and musty because of all the wetness that can never be soaked out. It's just horrible experience in 
the metro system cabs, the older ones with carpet, because of a, one inappropriate material choice. The new metro system uh, subway cars today, finally, after several iterations, they finally have gone with only new subway cars with a um, linoleum a floor finish that's so much more durable, no mold, no no moist, um, musty feel. Uh, you know, carpets are about three times as heavy when they're removed fully worn than when installed because it's that much dirt and debris gets into carpets. It's just not a healthy environment. This is the right material. So looking at buildings, we have to make the same kind of choices. If we're in a brutally hot uh, environment with a brutal sun like Santa Fe, a Tex 111 wood panel siding on a wall doesn't have a chance of lasting and not requiring a ton of maintenance. There's a reason why in Santa Fe, New Mexico, stucco is such a prevailing choice. It just is durable for the climate. It just works well. And of course, deep set windows are also a nice feature. But again, it's the right material for the right climate. In cold climates, you don't want ceramic tile roofs. They basically, with the capillary action, will suck up water in winter in between the tiles, freeze, thaw, you wind up with a lot. Real for a cold climate. Believe it or not, outdoor air conditioning compressors are a horrible choice along the Gulf Coast and the East Coast, where you have tremendously um, salty air uh, and a very corrosive environment. This is a uh, air conditioning compressor, and it's not even 18 months. And look how much corrosion is happening. So if you really want to make the optimum choice, you would use a geothermal system with the unit indoors away from the corrosive environment. And this will last 25 years as opposed to the system failing after only 18 months outdoors. These are the rooftops in Melbourne, Australia, where they're virtually all dark gray and incredibly sun intensive because it's a material that is very dark and absorbs the sun in a climate that is incredibly hot and uh, a very poor choice compared to Bermuda, where it's all white roofs that reflect the sun. They recognize the climate is, again, very, very hot in seven, eight months a year. And just those white roofs alone will cool the uh, space inside by over 30 degrees. So just the appropriate material is a completely different impact. And it looks beautiful because it fits the location. So it looks great and it just works so much better. Uh, here's a typical grass lawn in Phoenix, Arizona. Finally, we stopped the madness and lawns are uh, finally not going in Phoenix. They recognize a desert's not a good place for grass. In fact, a lot of people who moved to Phoenix originally went there because of allergies and they brought the allergies with them by putting in so much grass in Phoenix. So. You just, again, it's obvious choices that we just need to be aware of. And what's interesting is the right choice, the appropriate material looks better. It's, it, it's, it fits the area. It's not phony looking. It's authentic. It can be done in a way with good design that it just still has an outstanding landscape outcome. So essentially appropriate materials look better, last better, and in the end are lower cost. Here's a regionally inappropriate material in Oakland Hills. Uh, these were the homes that burnt almost like a wildfire um, in 1991 across uh, the hill south of Berkeley. It was devastating. You can just see all the destroyed homes in this image. But I'll call your attention to one home that was standing. And when I lived in California at this time, it always was remarkable to me that the prevailing choice uh, to maintain your home value and that everyone's preference uh, went to was a wood shake roof, which was effectively putting kindling on your roof. In contrast, this one home with a cement tile roof was a home standing, along with the stucco finish, non-combustible materials. They're appropriate in a state that is designed to burn, which is California. You know, basically, basically three or four months a year, you're going to grow a tremendous amount of fuel when the rains come in, October to January. They grow amazing amount of grasses. They grow a lot of shrubs, and then the trees are there. It's just designed to burn. And to put wood, wood kindling as your roofing material is an insane choice. It's also very inappropriate to use vented attics in these climates, but that's another discussion. 
You don't want embryos able to get inside the attic through the vents and the soffits and effectively communicate the fire to the inside the attic. Originally appropriate materials here uh, in Mexico Beach, Florida. Uh, uh, this was Hurricane Harvey, I believe, and one house was left almost unscathed compared to the devastation all around it. And again, the regionally appropriate materials in this case uh, were concrete pilings to raise the house, which was very smart in a place designed to flood. Then the wall system was made of a insulated concrete forms, which are very impact resistant. If you know how they work, the concrete is poured in the voids of these styrofoam blocks that form the walls. Um, and the roof system was unvented again so that winds can get in and blow off the roof. Every part of the design was respective of the location, appropriate materials, appropriate design, and the result is a home that is fully intact while every other home almost is devastated all around it. And of course, you see this over and over again in flood prone locations. Uh, this is after Hurricane Sandy, homes are flooding. When we simply raise homes, knowing we're in a, a, a flood prone area or a hurricane prone area, we are positioning ourselves to be appropriate, appropriately resilient and designed for that location. So this is what we have to do when we don't get it right the first time. This is raising a house, again, after Hurricane Sandy to get it a high elevation. Similarly, after Hurricane Katrina, they were raising homes, but we, uh, at least when we do replace homes, we should thoughtfully make them appropriately resilient for the location that we're being built. Uh, this is a project that's getting a little bit of criticism lately. Um, this is uh, um, the project um, in Ward 9 to rebuild uh, where they used the architects. Uh, Make It Right Foundation came in and hired some world-class famous architects. And um, putting a sail on the roof of a building in a hurricane zone as a replacement would, uh, would ask you if this is appropri appropriately resilient, as is the flat roofs and the rain catchers and up above the living spaces. A lot of choices made here that are suspicious, but you see that we have to be thoughtful when we, we're in an area that has lots of uh, prevailing risk challenges that have to be managed. And lastly, on fit the site, I mentioned community connection. You know, and when the front of the building is basically, uh, basically just a garage door, we're isolating ourselves from a community. And so we get a lot better when the doors face in the front, maybe the garage either doesn't exist or is in the back of the building. And again, if we get a front porch at, as well as the front door in front, again, the community connections keep getting stronger. So these are very simple concepts and the difference is significant in how the building will live and connect with the neighborhood. Here's one design again with townhouses where, again, they created one central courtyard to uh, put the community connection on steroids. So here's the courtyard uh, surrounded by the townhouses and an amazing opportunity for neighbors to engage, interact. And again, if we start with these concepts on the very front end, we start to get the outcomes that we want. The other way, again, with community connection, again, is to really be uh, um, really consistent about using front porches uh, so people in neighborhoods have a place to engage with their neighbors. Uh, here's an article about uh, Teddy Kessie's front porch is a heavenly place. We know this and we see more and more neighborhoods are really focused front porches, community connection, uh, open spaces, all the things we need to really foster interaction in our communities. Okay, we did fit to site. That gets us to the very next topic, natural comfort. If you notice on the right side, we're kind of tracking the five concepts as we move through them. And what's interesting, we can go to the cliff dwellings of Mesa Verde, Colorado, over a thousand years ago, we knew how to do this. We knew that we had this amazing resource, natural comfort, the sun, the different angles of the sun over the different times of the year, and all that could be leveraged for truly comfortable homes year round. So what the um, uh, ancient Indians did in this Mesa Verde development was they found a cliff that was facing south and chose that for the location of the village. Then they built their village underneath the overhang that was situated so it would allow the winter sun that was lower to come through, heat the thermal mass of the structure, make the building comfortable throughout the winter. And then the summer, 
the higher sun angle would block the sun from hitting the structures and the thermal mass would store the cold airflow coming through the structures during the very cool nights. And you had year round comfort, no space conditioning, all, all done naturally with the uh, natural uh, arc of the sun in the winter, the summer, and just using God-given gifts for natural comfort. Similarly, the Talos Pueblo colony in Talos, New Mexico, did a similar kind of solution, but without the advantage of the cliff overhang to block the sun. So they did essentially recessed windows, they did thick um, masonry construction to create lots of thermal mass. The diurnal swings of cool nights and warm evening, uh, warm days would be balanced by the thermal mass. The recess of the windows would shade a lot of the sun from coming in and there were shutters and so forth to block them. So essentially, again, leveraging natural comfort for uh, buildings that live better. Uh, in contrast, you'll look at this, this structure. This is city center in Las Vegas. And essentially, if there was a power failure or oh, oh, four or five or six hours, you would die in these buildings. The brutal heat of the sun hitting these buildings with no operable windows and the system shut down, it would be so brutal inside, you would die in, in about six hours. So we're building buildings where if the power goes down, we die. And that's not leveraging natural comfort. So uh, result is that we give up on some really compelling experiences glare-free views. If we use natural shading and overhangs, we don't have to have glare. Uh, free heating and cooling, about 25%. If we actually orient our homes properly and we leverage uh, storage and the benefit of the heat from the sun in the winter and block it in the summer, we can save 25% in our heating and cooling expenses. And then the comfort superior, particularly because radiant surface temperatures that are managed are 40% more impact than managing ambient temperature. Radiant surface temperatures, 40% more impact than ambient. So if we keep surface temperatures cool in summer and warm in winter, it's a feeling that is completely at a new level in terms of comfort. And natural light is always far more desirable than artificial light and fresh air, designing for a building to capture fresh air and fresh, fresh natural breezes is always preferable to just forcing air through a building. So these are the experiences. They're all great, something we all crave, and we can deliver them with natural comfort. And here they are, natural views, because we don't have to worry about shading and glare. Superior comfort when surfaces just warm around us and just radiate to us and make us feel incredible in this space. And then the free heating and cooling. This is uh, the result of a study done in California looking at the light blue, the coastal locations and the inland locations, how much savings could be derived just from orientation, not even factoring in the overhang. If you put in the overhang, the savings get greater. But basically, you can see in the coastal climates, you can save about 46% on cooling and about 27%, 28% on heating. Inland, you can save about 25% on cooling and about, oh, 17% on heating. Again, this goes up if you start using thermal mass and overhangs and other techniques. And we don't have to look around too far to see that all of us prefer natural light, even our pets. This is my dog every day at the same place, wants the natural light in the morning. And if you look at this space, all well, the natural light coming in, no artificial light, you know just how preferable that is to artificial light. Uh, it just feels better. We, we always know that we feel better in natural light. Uh, their buildings have less illness, less sick days. Um, they, have, uh, less re they have more retention for employees and commercial buildings that use natural light. You know, there are more less absenteeism at schools. I mean, there's so many studies that show how preferable this is. It's transformative. So there are five concepts for us in natural comfort. Natural heating, natural cooling, natural fresh air, natural comfort control, and natural lighting. So how do we get there? And first of all, what does it cost for us to get there? And what's amazing is we're good designers. It's just our natural preference and how we design, it costs nothing more. It's just applying good design practices to get the, uh, to exploit these concepts. So how do we get there? There are five tools that we can be done at no additional cost for construction. Solar orientation, 
solar shading, thermal mass for storage, cross ventilation for natural cooling, and prevailing breeze orientation also for natural cooling and natural fresh air. So here's a matrix that shows how to combine and mix and match these. If I want to natural heat my building, I use solar orientation, solar shading, and thermal mass. I use the same three for natural cooling along with cross ventilation and prevailing breeze orientation. Fresh air, I capture with cross ventilation and prevailing breeze orientation. Natural comfort control, which means that we use the natural storage and diurnal swing capabilities of our building with thermal mass. And we just let the building float and stay comfortable day round, day, uh, the full day by leveraging the storage. And natural lighting we achieve with solar orientation and solar shading. So basically we have a toolkit and we have these experiences and it's a much, much better building. So orientation, the concepts, pretty basic. In the summer, basically the sun rises in the northeast, goes very high in the day, middle of the day to its peak, and then it sets, sets in the northwest, very low in the sky in the northwest. In the equinox in March and September, we come up in the east, we set in the west, and we're about mid-height during the day, midday. And finally, uh, in the winter, we come up in the southeast, we're low in the day, uh, the middle, and then we set in the southwest. The arc gets smaller in the winter and bigger in the summer. And so here's the outcome when we ignore solar orientation and solar shading. And this is a house in Florida, I believe, Orlando. And what you should do is notice every window. And what you see probably is that the window blinds are shut 24 hours a day, just like they are now right during the day. So when we use solar orientation and solar shading, it's like we throw in the view for free because you don't need to use the window treatments. A lot of owners get frustrated having to operate uh, morning and day, every day, the blinds and often leave them shut almost all the time. So big difference when you miss solar orientation and solar shading. And I also encourage you to look at the house next door, the window above the garage, even that window house by house by house going down the block, you'll probably see the same thing, all the blinds are shut. Uh, in contrast, here's a friend of ours, works at National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Paul Torsolini's house, he built in winter, uh, he built in Eastford, Connecticut. This is a shot in winter, as you would hope, you see the sun hitting all the south facing windows. He lives on the second floor and he's getting all the natural light, he's getting all the warm solar, heat gain that's desirable in the winter, and he's extremely happy. Then uh, go to winter, uh, summer, and everything flips. The, uh, the overhang is set just so it will shade all the windows. Uh, the temperature may be 96 outside, but next to the window, probably 76. So you're getting 20 degrees almost right next to the window. It's fully shaded. You have the daylight. You don't have the glare. It's just an amazing benefit just to do something that costs nothing. Face the building the right direction and then use your overhang by design to block the summer sun and let in the winter sun. Uh, this is a house I designed back in 1982 for a client in Chico, California. Again, uh, those, are not, uh, those overhangs are blocking all the windows, natural. You don't have to worry about the glare. You have all the light come through. You don't have to worry about window treatments. Those are not skylights, by the way, on the um, left and right wing of the home. Those are uh, actually solar hot water batch heaters that do an incredible job. And because of some privacy issues, we also included a courtyard so they had a view and a place where they could be by themselves. But again, uh, all this works. And you'll notice we even had wing walls because when the, uh, the sun is so brutal in the Central Valley of California, we like to block the sun in the morning coming up and the sun going down at night, and the wing walls do that for us very effectively. This is another house where I had a bigger challenge in 1983. Um, the design preference was given to me, but the lot was also a bigger constraint because the south was on the side yard facing to the right. So we had to use that for um, the window orientation, create an, a, a very, very aesthetic side yard, as you can see over here with a patio. A great place to hang and then have the pool in the back and a very deep overhang to block the east morning light fairly effectively most of the year. So again, just thinking about our orientation, making a bad orientation work 
as best we could because the lot faced the back to the east. Thermal mass is a very simple concept. Uh, when the sun comes in uh, at a low angle in the winter, because it's low in the sky, have surfaces that can collect the heat. It could be masonry walls around a fireplace. It could be masonry floors. And it, all day, it absorbs the heat so the space doesn't overheat. And then at night, it releases the heat to keep it cool. And it, during the morning, we can start to cycle over again, collect heat, and then release it at night. It's the beauty of natural comfort control. It's done automatically. You don't know it's working, and it feels better. You have cool surface temperatures all throughout the summer, and the, I mean all, all throughout the summer and warm temperatures throughout the winter. And this is what it looks like in reality. It can look beautiful. Uh, this is just again a, a tile floor. Again, the sun can come in and hit it. Uh, this is another south fa south facing room with tile floor, lots of masonry. Uh, I mentioned the masonry fireplace uh, op option is, uh, is used here. Again, the high clear story windows let the sun hit that masonry fireplace. But you have all these surfaces collect the warmth during the day and ooze it out at night. It's totally cozy, uh, day round, day yeah, full day round and full year round as well. Uh, thermal storage can be as simple as just using the exposed concrete. There are various uh, pigments for floors and polishes, and so even exposed concrete is a great option for thermal storage. Prevailing or breeze orientations is as simple as knowing which direction uh, the breezes come uh, that are cool at night, uh, particularly during the summer when they're desirable. Uh, setting up your window configurations to capture them, let them thrift, flow through the space. In Sacramento, where I used to live, Every night, bankable, you had like 55 degree breezes, delta breezes coming in that you can capture and cool your house off at night in no time. And again, if you stack effect, you even accelerate and enhance that flow through so it's even more effective. Again, with the, and the warm air rise throughout the house, the cool air come in low, it's incredibly how effective you can make cross ventilation. And the best part about it looks great. Here's a house, cross ventilation. Windows open, collecting the breezes, and just when homes are working with nature, they look and feel better. It's just, again, I'll keep using the same word, transformative. Now, here's a natural comfort design I did in 1984 for a project, and uh, again, while I was in Sacramento with the utility program, uh, working with builders, wanted to show a 1,500 square foot house could be a very sumptuous house and be completely integrated with natural comfort. Back then, we used to call it passive solar. And so here you see the south orientation is where most of the windows are gonna face. You see the wing walls, again, to block the low morning sun and the low evening sun in the west. And then we have extensive thermal mass to capture uh, and store the solar heat that comes through. We have a roof for solar systems in the future. Even then, we were starting to think about solar at the California Energy Commission, solar electric. Uh, and then we have overhangs and trellises that block all the uh, sun from coming in in the winter. We completely blocked. We have a very cool area next to the house, even if it's over 100 degrees outside, it'll be about 80 next to the house with the shading. Uh, now moving on from natural comfort to right size in the right way. Uh, it, the first thing I wanna point out is uh, homes have gotten much bigger and occupancy has gotten smaller. So. From 1970 to 2015, the average square footage of a home went up from 1,500 to 2,700, basically almost an 80% increase, the number, while the number of occupants shrunk from 3.14 to 2.54. So we basically, square foot per occupant increased 120% from about 480 square feet to 1,060 square feet. So incredible how much more space we put into homes. And the big question is, can we make homes live just as sumptuously without all the square footage? And there are two buckets or two of strategies that I'll show you for doing that. Uh, first is leveraging space. Make the space you have work better and feel live bigger. And you do that with open layouts, eliminating rooms that you don't need or combining rooms so they kind of live bigger using a lot of built-in furniture because it's amazing how much waste is associated with freestanding furniture. And I'll also mention how much 
uh, as we move to new sharing economy and minimalist preferences, people don't want to own things. It costs more to move furniture often than it's worth when you have a reasonable size move. And having more built-in furniture can increase the effect of square footage 25 to 30%. The other thing you want to do is you want to minimize your circulation. I never had a client ask me, can I have more hall space? However, the circulation space you do have should be generous. It shouldn't be just a bare bones minimum width and feel kind of squeezed in. And it should always have daylight when possible. And lastly, indoor-outdoor linkages. Making one space feel like it extends to an outdoor space is an incredible way to make it feel bigger. And the other strategy is to enhance the space you have, make it live bigger. You can do that by you can do that by varying the ceiling heights, using high quality trim, hardware and finishes throughout, uh, effective use of colors. Again, the word transformative will come up with colors, natural lighting, and using artificial lighting to its best effect. All these things work together to make spaces live bigger even though there might not be as big. So here's a room where you have a very much of a, of a uh, open layout versus a closed layout. So it just lives bigger because all the rooms are connected. We also if you have a dining space off the kitchen, got rid of the dining room, so you picked up space that way. Uh, you have direct linkages to outdoor patios and living spaces and decks. You have built-in furniture uh, throughout, not just the kitchen. You have hutches and shelves and uh, uh, and other kinds of uh, built-in desks that make a space live bigger. You have very good quality trim and hardware, which feels rich. And you have daylighting throughout and effective lighting throughout the space. So it just lives bigger. Here's a space with a little bit less opulent finishes. But all the same principles are working just the same. You have the open layout. You have the dining next to the kitchen. You get rid of the dining room that's formal along with that. You have the linkage to the out outdoor spaces, a fairly good quality trim and finishes, good use of colors and daylighting and lighting design. So there are many ways to skin the cat. You kind of get the idea that spaces can live bigger if we just use these right sizing principles. And outdoor spaces are becoming incredibly important. I used to tout these five and a half years ago when we started workshops. That was less common back then. But we knew this was a huge opportunity to make homes live bigger. If I can go outside and have another room with a hat without having to build an enclosure around it, it's a freebie. So here's one great example of an outdoor living space off a great room. Here's another of a dining space and a small little landscaping area, then a sitting space. And all of a sudden you transform a backyard that would be maybe fractionally used to something that's just used all the time. And again, it doesn't take too much, just a good patio, some reasonably good furnishings. In this case, there is a amenity that's a little higher end with the fireplace, but you, but all these things are so effective at making your home live bigger because now you can just go and transition right outdoors and it's like you're part of the home. And we have opportunities in dry climates to put in some water features and cool off the space. That's also another way to enhance the um, outdoor spaces. One of the biggest sources of stresses in life in most household households is clutter. It just makes you feel anxious. And um, it's something we all know, we may not think about it, but clutter is an incredibly difficult way to live. So I'm a big advocate, I have been, since I began designing homes 40 years ago, always using built-ins. More and more, that concept is becoming even more and more compelling. Again, I mentioned it's a sharing economy. We just don't want to own stuff. It costs thousands and thousands of dollars it costs to do a move of substantial amount of furniture, often is more than that furniture we're moving is worth. And more importantly, we waste so much space to get the same amount of storage and, and effective display space without the built-ins, it'd be fraction if it was relying on freestanding furniture that you hope you could cobble together to fit into a space. And there are things that are awkward that sometimes are hard to store, like maybe in that window seat and those 
drawers below is a great place to put blankets and things that normally are difficult to find storage for. Here's again another built-in window seat with cushions and it gives you more seating, it gives you a place to store things, uh, it gives you shelving, it gives you so much opportunity to make a space feel bigger because we're taking clutter and we're getting it out of our life. Another again window seat, but this time you have the hutch, you have the shelves, you have the lighting, everything's kind of working and small spaces live bigger. And you don't need the sizes we often provided because we threw in so much buffer to manage all the permutations what could happen when we had to go with freestanding furniture. The table and chairs should be all you need for this room. And here's a concept that's often missing, which is built-in storage and closets. What always surprised me about the uh, lack of this being standard is that this you know will delight your customer. And in business, when you know you, what will delight a customer, that's like a freebie, because now you just know how to just make them more satisfied and a better referral. We know no one wants this kind of closet. Now, maybe we all can't afford this kind of closet, but we can approximate towards this with even more inexpensive solutions. I know I've done my own built-in closets for kits that were about $400. And essentially, it's not that difficult for the value, the, 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 the delight, the experience you will provide when you provide great storage is so worth it. I will steal the money from somewhere else, wasted space that's just no one needs and use it to furnish a closet because people love good storage. Well, here's a case where I have just normally what would be just empty space below a stair. I will also have a free office, the desk, the storage, you know, all the uh, computer capabilities right here and a wasted space becomes an office in my home, all because I use built-ins to make a space that otherwise might not work be completely functional. And the key thing I always mention is, Joe, you have to be thoughtful to make sure these things all work together. And what the car industry does is they come up with packages, trim and finish packages with cars. So with one car, you get one kind of fabric and one kind of amenities. And the car, you move out to leather and other kind of amenities. And then you get the special edition that has all the bells and whistles and everything kind of fits together. And the same thing in housing, we have to figure the trim, the hardware, uh, all the casings and moldings, everything has to be designed so they fit. So you may have at the base level something pretty basic, you can move up to a, another set that's a little higher end, and maybe the hardware and, and, the, and, uh, and fixtures all are a step up, and then you have the ultra high end with the most rich trim and fixtures and uh, moldings and casings and hardware. Everything should work in packages so they kind of work together. As the designer, you're kind of the control point to make sure that things make sense in a home. When you have like a super expensive piece of hardware on a cheap door, you know that's not a good uh, uh, outcome for your client. And there's some really good cheap solutions. Now, this is just MDF trim that when you use color and a good effective proportions in the trim and how it's laid out in the house and contrast and color can work quite quite well. And again, here's everything kind of being packaged together. You got trim, you got color, you got uh, finishes and hardware. Everything's kind of working together at one level. And you know, more and more, I'm finding studies and research back up a lot of the claims we've been making for years with the workshops that this stuff's transformative and it translates to value. So here's one Zillow study that finds just the right color would increase the value by over five thousand dollars. So you know, some of this data is uh, needs to be further looked at, but this truly does add value. Here's one example. Here's a parking garage uh, uh, without color and without lighting. And just to show color and lighting, what they do to space afterwards, it's a very similar space, but with color and lighting. One experience, second experience. Just that's why the value is so easy for me to believe that it's added to, to these homes. So lighting again, transformational, and the new capabilities with the LED lighting and the OLED lighting and with good designers who know what they're doing, a space will look completely different when good design kicks in. Again, lighting's transformational, what it can do, and now you have the ability with LED to have almost complete dynamic control of color and how you can set spaces to look almost any way you want for any mood you want. So more and more the expertise in the space is going to become really important when you design homes. 
And yet, here's a home from 1984 as well. I did a remodel where I just added the columns and the arch to the living room off the entryway. But again, notice the consistent use of lighting in uh, the living room with the scuppers, uh, uh, the sconce lights, and you go to the hallway and the sconce lights back there, hidden lighting behind the archway to the living room. So you see the lighting, but not the light itself as you walk in, but the effect of the lighting. But really even back in 1984, with less technology choices, we're able to do transformative outcomes just with color and lighting, good choices. So again, you have to make all this work together, but these are your tools to make your house live bigger. Tr trim and hardware finishes are properly selected and packaged in your homes. And again, to pull back that home I showed you earlier that we did again in the 80s while I was in California for a project with the utility, to show you how all the right sizing concepts are applied here. We have an open layout, we have compact circulation, that's all the circulation in the home. We have all these built-ins in blue throughout the house to make a 1,500 square foot house live more like 2,200 square feet. Don't forget this is three bedrooms, it's got a large master suite, a large master bathroom, has a split hall bathroom, has a full laundry room, has a full large kitchen. You kind of get the idea, that's a lot in 1,500 square feet. We vary the ceiling height by using uh, the plant this time was used SIPs that would slope up and create higher ceilings and use uh, keep it flat over the core so you have places for your mechanicals, extra storage, and your ductwork. And then you have the indoor outdoor linkages throughout the home. So your indoor extends to the outdoor and just flows and you have living space working right off one off the other. Okay, concept number four uh, is architectural integrity and the three basic ways that we're going to do this. And uh, the word simple is really important when it comes to architectural integrity. This is a personal, a high, high recommendation for me. Uh, I know a lot of us as designers like to add a lot of rich, complex architectural solutions. Uh, I'm going to suggest to you that simple is an amazingly elegant way to design buildings. They work better and they last better. So simple and functional exteriors, efficient and functional floor plans, and then quality materials and details and color throughout that are respective of all everything else that's going on. And you kind of know it when you see it. This is Portofino, Italy. I was there on vacation, oh, about a decade ago. And I always found it remarkable that it didn't take a lot to just completely blow me away with the richness of the space. And yet it's just flat facade, some fairly modest trim, just some great use of, uh, of different height buildings, but color and texture. You kind of get the feeling this just is a really special space without having to work so hard to be special. Uh, here's Venice where we began the trip. And in Venice, of course, again, it's amazing with negative spaces and positive spaces, but color, trim, and just uh, simple shapes and just with good massing, good proportions, and everything works. It doesn't take a lot. This is pretty simple. You can make this so complicated and often run into all sorts of trouble. Here's a building with four different materials on the front. You can't even tell because they use one color for all four materials. Then they raise the entry so the protection from weather will be compromised when rain slopes and comes inside under the overhang. Very complicated roof, looks like it just did what it had to do based on the floor plan. There was no conception of the roof to be uh, good drainage and a good design from the beginning. It just was going to match whatever floor plan that came up. You know, kind of know this. I got this image from an ad for roofing. But you look at this design and go, it just doesn't have to be this complicated. There's so many issues here. There's so many complications. There's so much cost involved to do this. And when the poor homeowner has to replace a roof next time, it'll be incredibly expensive. This just doesn't have to be that hard. And here's even a more basic house, and again, way over complex. You can see this is just not thought through from the beginning to be an effective, good, uh, architecturally uh, simple design. So that's one part of integrity. The other part's just being fake. You know, when I see fake shutters, I kind of go nuts. Um, it's just stapled to the side of the windows. They serve no purpose. It kind of, it just takes away any thought, 
authenticity in the architecture. And yet when I see real shutters, it's remarkable there's the richness because you know the architectural element is doing something. It's creating a space that works better and therefore it looks better. And here's in uh, shades being used in the US, not just in Europe. And you can see again, this looks wonderful. We have maybe west facing windows. We have no way to block the sun. It's just great to come up with an architectural solution for a problem. And it looks elegant because it works. And I love this home. I found, um, I, I forget which website I went through and I just stopped right away. I said, this is everything. It's proportion, it's massing, it's simple. It's, it's just got color, it's got texture. It's just doing everything right without working too hard. You know, we don't have to make this business of designing homes any more complex than it needs to be. And you know, sticking with this problem with authenticity and fake design, this is a design where clearly the front elevation was laid out and the side elevations on another sheet of paper, and no one thought about meshing the two because when I go around the corner of that garage, why is there a material change from the brick to the vinyl back to the brick just for a two, two and a half little stub wall going in. How much cost are we really saving by not having the material continue and putting that one material in there? And then even the whole idea of facade architecture, we have one material slapped onto the front without any architectural massing to make it look like it's a rich part of the front of the home. And then you have at a corner, you meet up against the second material. It looks fake, it feels fake, it looks like a facade, almost like a Hollywood front. And it just, someone just arbitrarily thought this must have value. And then it becomes copied throughout a whole Eastern seaboard. So in contrast, you take another home in this neighborhood that just said, you know, let's use the same material all four, all four, four sides and it looks more authentic. At least it's not trying to fake me out by pretending this is a material I wish I could have on all four sides, but I can't. So I'll just fake you out and put it on the front. Now the key thing to do when you are more authentic is take the money you save from taking out that brick front and reinvest it in a front porch. Now take all that brick cost, use it for a front porch, and now I have authentic and I have the front porch, I have the community, and you can start making all these pieces work together. Once you start using architectural integrity and just being more authentic about where you are, it works better. And in terms of functional layouts, so lots of good guidance for how to lay out rooms like, that are complicated like kitchens that we can follow. <clears throat> but here's basically a good example of what's an efficient and functional floor plan. And we covered some of these principles a little bit earlier. One is you always design with furniture. It will expose wasted space that you can get rid of. It will ensure that the space will live optimally because you want a, a place that lives for the clients. It will tell you where to locate outlets and where to locate doors and where to put in built-ins. If you are designing without furniture, you're not designing. You have to design fully integrated with the furniture and it will optimize your floor plan. Then you want to use the open layouts eliminate combined rooms, the indoor-outdoor linkages, and then minimize storage. And you can see this floor plan is efficient, functional, hardly any circulation, has nice flow, has great uh, spaces, and it's leveraging a very narrow lot to live better. And there's a side entry, the secret sauce, so you get the full front room and the full front porch, the quiet side with no windows so that I can hang out on my active side and not have my neighbors looking into my private little special oasis of a courtyard that I have. And again, efficient and functional with this layout, I have a big luxurious kitchen, I have a great room, I have an office center off the kitchen right over here. I have full master suite with amazing amount of storage and a full master bathroom, a split hall bath so one person can use the sink, another take, take a shower. I have a large laundry room and storage throughout the house. So it's just efficient floor plans make them very functional. And again, the materials and the details are critical with architectural integrity. And uh, I'll use a, a food store as an example. So here's a typical chain food store where the 
uh, architectural design is very low priority. So we have very cheap ceiling tiles, incredibly cheap lighting, incredibly cheap flooring, uh, displays are second, not nearly optimized. And you contrast this basic uh, everyday food store with a, in this case, Whole Foods food store, and you look how they repurpose money to add values. They get rid of the cheap ceiling, we don't need it, and use color painted on the existing finishes, you know, the roofing and the ducts to add value. I don't know if that's a cost equal trade off, but even for a small increase in price, if there is one, the again, outcome is transformative. Then they get rid of the cheap floor and they polish the concrete. And again, it's authentic. It looks better. It feels better. And they got rid of the cheap displays and took other savings to do much, much more rich and uh, elegant displays, color and, and signage. All of it just creates a completely different shopping experience because of design. So again, materials, detail, color, they're all your tools to create designs that work. This is a very simple, very affordable home, but because again, it just put a slight more effort into the trim, a slight more effort into the color proportions, very good, simple, basic roof design, and it works. And for a simple home, by making those small investments, we can say even affordable home occupants get the dignity of a really great design really important to do. Again, this is one of the first projects I ever did. I got to California uh, for this friend. He, he said, please redo this house. So the whole back is redone. I had a little money left over in the front and we transformed it just with color and trim, just the basics. And of course, the new windows didn't hurt as well. So we go from this to this with colors, trim, and some new windows. So this, we don't have to overcomplicate our lives as designers. And this brings me to the last part, uh, the last part of the framework for really great designs, which is we have to integrate systems. And I mentioned there are three different groups of systems, 12 in total. So first we have to manage our infrastructure, uh, which is the framing and structure of the building. Then all the HVAC system, the equipment and the ductwork and all the plumbing, the runs and the location of the fixtures so they can be optimized. And then all the electric and lighting in the home. And then we have the livability with furniture, storage, lighting, and with our designs. And then on the performance side, we have to keep water out of the building, water management. We have to design so we conserve water. We have to optimize solar and we have to optimize the disaster resistance. So these are kind of the 12 systems that we have in our homes. On uh, structural, you know cheap products and materials come in two and four foot modules. So just so often we can just design our dimensions so there's no waste and no cutting. Uh, the wall dimensions and floor plans can be in two four foot modules. And our roof, no one cares what the slope is because most typically today we're using duct, I mean, uh, trusses for our roofs. And if a truss manufacturer gets a request for a 5.16 slope or a 4.9 slope or a 5.0 slope, they don't care. It doesn't have to be exactly five. It could be 5.16 or 4.86. Whatever gets you to an exact two foot or four foot dimension so you don't have any cutting or waste. In the case of a two foot, there might be one cut, but then you just use the material on the opposite side. And of course, if you have a ridge vent, you have to account for the, account for the few inches on either side for the ridge vent. And we have to think about our floor plans and how they'll work with the structure. It's not ideal to have a column sticking out in the middle of a room. So again, we have to plan for this when we design our homes. And our HVAC needs to be integrated, not just slapped into an attic that's unconditioned and going to compromise its performance. And who knows what we do when it's time to replace that equipment and get it out of the attic. I don't even know if you, uh, the hatch hole openings that are left are big enough to get the equipment out. And just the poor performance that will result because of this location. So we have to get our duct work inside the home. We have to design this. We can as architects hope this gets figured out in the field or some HVAC contractor will figure it out for us. It's our job as designers to think about 
how the ducts will run so they will be inside the condition space. This is your job. This can be done. And there are lots of new technologies and systems that make it easier to do. And we have to think, of, think about our choices for equipment. You know, this is a compressor farm. You know, if a line of compressor is going to be the experience we want to have for these homeowners, one after the other lined up, or are there other solutions? Again, geothermal systems sometimes can be a solution for getting us so we don't have to have all those compressors outside our homes if they're going imposed on the outdoor spaces that we have. We can case by case look at what's the right solution. And, you know, a man cave probably is probably better off without a sump pump in it. That's my preference. But you kind of get the idea that, you know, we can start thinking these things through, know how spaces will be used, and make these decisions on the front end. And also in plumbing, we can also think about what the roof will look like when all the uh, plumbing vents start coming through the roof. You know, you don't have to do uh, plumbing vents. There are low air emittance valves that uh, avoid plumbing vents. And here's a builder that doesn't want all these plumbing vents and made the choice early in design. Vent pipes coming through them. And also plumbing systems, think about really special features that add incredible value. 60% uh, of homeowners have pets. 50% have dogs. So maybe we want to think about providing dog showers in our, in our multifamily homes in a central facility or even in single family homes in our mudrooms. So there's your dog watch wash station right there in the mudroom. Not a big feature and also a great place to do some maintenance and cleaning of things that you don't want to do in the kitchen. With electric systems, we know if we have a light that's going to be in the floor, we have to have an outlet there. Here's another example where we know once we do the furniture, the light will be. Located where the place where we'll need a floor outlet, we know we have to have a floor outlet. And the furniture not integrated, we talked about designing with furniture. And just to give you an example how important that can be, once I know in this home that this is a furn likely furniture arrangement, it tells me where I should put my closet doors so that I leave room for a dresser. And that's just to have this opening here extend all the way to the wall. And getting back to storage as a system, when the car designers laid out cars I purchased, I'm always amazed at all the thought that goes into all the storage that's needed in a car. This is a quick list of things I can store in my car that were integrated into the design of the car and its interior. And it's always incredibly impressive to me, all these options. So I made a similar list what we as designers and architects and builders need to integrate in terms of storage and homes. And this is a long list. I'm not going to read it to you. It's there more just to show you that there's really a substantial amount of storage requirements that really need to be a checklist that we work with every time we lay out a home design or any kind of building design. So I know these are things that we need in almost all homes. And therefore, we should thoughtfully have those solutions and not say to the homeowner, you go figure it out. And the difference is remarkable. You know, here's a mudroom where the thoughtfulness about where to put uh, shoes and boots and umbrellas and jackets and where to keep papers and where to keep uh, uh, billing uh, materials out of the house and avoid clutter. And it's just when you lay out these things, you change people's lives if they work. Again, here's a litany of just examples that these are things that we have to think about that have to go in homes, you know, vacuum cleaners and and mops and brooms and and uh, and you know, all sorts of extra storage and extra blankets and places to hang clothes that are wet after washing. And, you know, all these things are part of how we live in homes. So they're part of the design process. Uh, Lighting, again, is transformative, so we need to be thoughtful how we do it outside, inside and outside. And what's amazing today with LED lights, a lighting system like this can use less than 100 watts and light a whole home. This system might be less than 60 watts and be able to light this house. So we have lots of capabilities. We need to think about part of our design outside as well as inside where the lighting should go and how it can work to best effect. And again, smart home technology is here 
it's not something that's in the future. We got to think about it now. We got to think about which systems are we going to use and where we're going to want cameras and sensors and how the whole home can work and integrate with all the technology that's out there today. And in terms of water conservation, we could be thoughtful about just reducing plumbing. We, I can save about $2,000 a home just with compact plumbing. In this one design, again, from another project in 1984, I don't know why I was on it back then, but even then I said I wanted this small home to have hardly any plumbing. So this one, oh, 12 foot wall has all the plumbing, hot water plumbing for the house, because they have the hot water tank serving two bathrooms, two full bathrooms, the kitchen and the laundry, obviously. And there's your wet area. And I would just have an electric coil heater underneath the laboratory sink because no one waits for hot water when they use hot water in laboratories. They turn it on, they never wait for the hot water and turn it off. So just have an instant electric coil underneath. The small additional expense for the amount of time it's used will be negligible and people actually get hot water when they clean their hands. Here's water management that's not integrated. We have all the water being collected and dropped right there next to the entry. Think about how water will drain from the roof, how you will collect it, how you get it off site. And PV integration, here's PV on the left, just slapped onto a roof. On the right, it's actually being used as the front porch, which means compared to here, I save all the cost of the sheathing over the roof framing. I save the cost of the underlayment, the cost of the roofing itself, the cost of the mounting rack for the PV. I simply mount the PV right on the framing. So who knows, that's another few thousand dollars of savings simply by integrating the PV into the design of the porch rather than putting on the roof, on a rack, on top of the roofing, on top of the uh, underlayment, and on top of sheathing. I can have the PV do all those functions for me and get all this daylight coming through into the first story. And so I get the benefit of cost, appearance, daylighting, and lower maintenance. Because I, if I have to replace this roof, I have to pull this PV system to replace the roof. This roof is all PV and stands on its own. And so here's a system where you ignore, it's being ignored and just slapped onto a roof. And here's a design that thoughtfully uses it as a porch. And again, you see extra daylight coming to the first floor. I have no sheathing. I have no underlayment. I have no roofing. I have no real substantial racking system except for some, well, much more limited racking system. I have the PV going right on the framing. And some panels can be mounted without even any racking system right onto the framing. And last part of our integrated systems is disaster resistance. and in places that flood, using concrete block rather than framing on the first floor is a smart thing. That is disaster resistant in a flooding location and you can go wood above, or better yet, raise the home so you're clear of the flooding locations. And we mentioned in wildfire locations using non-combustible combustible materials, in earthquake locations, uh, materials that can resist lateral loads, and in high wind locations, impact resistant choices. There are lots and lots of ways you can think through how to uh, enhance the resistance, uh, resilience of your home. So let me summarize basically this whole framework for good design. There are lots of opportunities to completely transform how your home lives. First, optimizing views. If they're natural views, take them. If there aren't, design the views in. Landscaping and hardscaping are transformational. Uh, I hate saying this, but I often feel that the landscape architecture trumps the building architecture because over time, the landscaping, the trees, everything that grows around the home, where you're lucky enough to have a location where you can use landscaping, will dominate the appearance of your home. And then the linkage to exterior spaces. You have to leverage all the opportunity to make the exterior just completely live off the interior of the home. Colors, transformative, lighting, quality finishes. Storage will make your home 20 to 30% bigger if you use uh, built-in throughout your house. And we're at that stage right now. We have to integrate all this technology into our homes. So what is good design? My summary to apply this framework. Uh, first, uh, for regular builders, I tell them they have to invest in experts really good architects, really good interior designers, color, lighting, technology, landscaping. 
One of the reasons we ask the solar decathlon students to work in collaborative teams and make that a requirement is we know that this is a reality. We have to integrate lots of diverse expertise to get great designs. It's really hard for one person to have it all and to have all this expertise. So we're starting off right now with the decathlon to get you working in a collaborative group because this is the real world. You have to know that if we're gonna optimize the consumer experience, all this expertise has to be brought to bear. You have to design for site and region. You have to optimize natural comfort. Again, you, you want those experiences, glare-free views, uh, natural uh, comfort and heat and cooling and breezes. All those experiences are so superior to artificial light, and artificial heating and cooling. And you want to right size with simple designs. Those two together are going to leverage you tremendous cost, cost savings. If my 1,500 square feet li lives like a 2,200 square foot home, that's 700 square feet of hard cost savings. If that's 660, if that's $80 a square feet, that's like $45,000 of savings. And then there are additional savings if my design simple, if I have less cutting, less weight, waste, two foot dimensions, if I don't have crazy complicated roofs, all of a sudden I have 50, 60, $70,000 of savings I can invest in the exterior, in the color, in the lighting, in all the landscaping and other choices that we just mentioned. So you wanna invest the savings in the transformational opportunities and you wanna integrate all major systems. You don't want bumps in your ceiling for ducts. You don't want to have a column sticking out in the middle of a functional space. You want to have roofs that drain effectively. You want to have HVAC systems that are fully integrated in the uh, condition space. You, you, you just got to get this all figured out. You can't say it's not my job. I'm just designing floor plan and architecture. And there it is. That's your framework. And that's what I teach to. And then we go up to, other, to the other four legs of the stool and we talk about community and we talk about performance, we talk about quality and we talk about sales because it's a five-legged stool. But now you got the one first key leg because design is critical in every product we make with no exception. So thank you so much. I hope this framework is useful for you. I can't wait to see your designs that you do and hope to see some of these ideas executed. Thank you so much.